In this video, I'm gonna be talking about how to read an EKG and what my general approach is. And this is a very simplified version, really just giving you the foundation for how you should approach every single EKG. For more educational resources, like our medical ID cards, check out medicalbasics.com. So what I'm going to be breaking this down to is pretty much how you've all been taught in regards to reading an EKG, which is talking about the rate, then going into the rhythm, and then talking about the different intervals as well as the axis, and whether or not there's any evidence of ischemia as well as hypertrophy. So the first thing that we're going to be doing is talking about the rate. And so I think there's a number of ways to actually look at the rate or calculate the rate. The first one is actually no calculation at all. It's actually written on the chart itself. So I think this is a good, pretty reliable way to, to figure out what the rate is very quickly. But I think you should also know just conceptually how we're getting this rate. And so I think how we break this down is, is in two ways. But before I talk about that, I want to just talk about all these different boxes and what they mean. So if you ever recall, there's little, they call them small boxes and they call them big boxes. So this is a small box right here. Here, and this would be considered a big box. So what does that represent on this graph right here? Well, this is a big box right there. And you can't see the small boxes because it's not zoomed out. It's not zoomed in enough. But you can reliably think that there's going to be a bunch of small boxes within that. And so we're just going to take the big boxes because that's all we can see. And essentially, one big box is broken down into an x-axis and y-axis. The x-axis is time. And that's going to be 0.2 seconds. And then the uh, y-axis is going to be the actual voltage. And it's 0.5 millivolts for this big box right here. So that's going to bring us to our next point of actually figuring out what the rate is going to be. And so in each of these EKG strips, this is a 12 lead EKG, a 12 EKG is going to be 10 seconds. So that means there's going to be 50 boxes that you're going to have because um, 50 times 0.2 is 10 seconds. So there's going to be 50 boxes right here. So how do we actually calculate the rate? So I think for me, the easiest way is really you're figuring out how many beats there are in this 10 second reading. And then you're going to multiply that by six because remember there's 10 times six is going to be 60 seconds. And so if you have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 beats within this uh, 10 second reading, that means it's going to be 10 times six equals a heart rate of 60. And we'll see here that the heart rate is in fact 60. So this is going to have a heart rate of 60 based off of this right here. The other method is going to be going into this 300, 150, 175, 60, so on and so forth rule. And you may be asking, what, what, well, first off, what is this? And then how do we use this? So it's really broken down by how many big boxes you have from beat to beat, from, from R wave to R wave. So here you see it's one, two, three, four, five. So there's five big boxes in between each of the R waves. So one, two, three, four, five. So the heart rate is 60. And so you may be asking, how are we even getting that? Like that makes no sense of how you would ever get that. Well, it really breaks down to this picture right here. If each of the R waves is separated by one box, that means in total, you're going to have in the 60 seconds, if each of the boxes is 0.2, you're going to have a total of 300 beats, right? This is 60 seconds divided by how big each of the boxes are, 0.2 seconds. That's going to be 300. Now, in a minute, you also have 60 seconds. Let's say each of them are two boxes. Well, two boxes is 0.4, and that's going to give us 150. Three boxes, and you can kind of go on from there and figure out how exactly that works. So that's how I kind of break it down. I think that for me, I prefer this because I, I can't remember all these different numbers. That's just too many numbers to remember, and it's not that helpful. Really, you're either going to be giving it a 10-second reading in a 12-lead EKG. You can also be given a 6-second reading. So always remember, it'll either be a 10-second uh, uh, reading, or it'll also be 6 seconds. And always remember, if you're given a 12-lead, it's always going to be this one at the bottom. This lead at the bottom is the only one that's going to be um, the actual full 10 seconds. The rest are just going to be segments of them. So that's kind of how I calculate it. But to be honest, I never calculate it. I just look, and I just trust it on the chart itself. But that's kind of the, the mental exercise that you should go through uh, so you at least know how to calculate the rate. The next thing is going to be the rhythm. So the rhythm can be broken down into two components. It'll either be regular or it'll be irregular. And irregular can be broken down again. So regular just means the distance between all the R waves is going to be equal, right? It's always equal. Um, 
And then in irregular, it means that the R waves obviously are not equally spaced out. But you can either have them regularly spaced out or irregularly spaced out. And what you kind of just break this down by is, is there a pattern? So in regularly irregular, there's a pattern, right? It's kind of like, okay, there's one, one, and then two, one, one, two, one, one, two. This one is just random. It's like one, two, three, one, four. And I'm just talking to the general spacing between the different R waves. I just made up those numbers. But essentially, you can kind of see what irregularly regular is as well as regularly irregular. If there's some type of pattern, it's going to be regularly irregular. The next thing is going to be the different intervals. And so this I always found to be kind of difficult to remember. And so I kind of just use my general like big picture of looking at it to see the, the gestalt of does it look normal or does it not look normal. But just so we know, the PR interval should be 120 to 200 milliseconds. That's going to be that interval right there. That's three to five small square. So this is pretty zoomed in. QRS should be less than 120 milliseconds or three small squares. And then the QT interval should be somewhere between nine to 11 small squares. So the next thing that I want to talk about is axis. And I personally thought that axis was either the most difficult thing to understand or the most difficult thing to remember when I was first starting out. But I want to try to make it as simple for you as possible so that really you only have to remember one rule in regards to axis. So to make things simple, you either are going to have a normal axis or you're going to have an abnormal axis. And so all this thing in pink right here, that's going to be normal. You need to just remember it's between negative 30 and 90 degrees, or at least be able to see that it's from negative 30 to 90 degrees. But you actually don't even have to remember that information. What you have to remember is this line right here. To have a normal axis, you have to have a P wave that's upright in 1 and 2 and inverted in AVR. And if you remember how you determine axis, essentially it is you shade in the parts that each of the different leads, whether it's up or down, is in, and you figure out where everything overlaps. And if it overlaps in this area, then it's gonna be a normal axis. If it overlaps in one of these other areas, it's gonna be an abnormal axis. So the way you do it is essentially, if it's positive, it's gonna be everything on this side. So let's take the lead one, for example. It's upright or positive in lead one. So that's gonna be all this right here. So I'm gonna to try to draw it as nicely as I can so that we can see where exactly everything will overlap. Okay, so it, we take everything perpendicular to the lead and we say all of that is positive or upright. So that's gonna be in lead one. The next one's gonna be lead two. And essentially that's gonna be everything perpendicular. So it's gonna be everything from negative 30 to 210, everything on this side, because it's positive. So I'm gonna draw it like this. So, so far we see that everything over here from negative 30 up until 210, all of that overlaps between negative 30 and negative 90. That's no longer overlapped by two of the leads. So that's already out of the picture. And so the last one that we do is inverted in AVR. So we see AVR goes from here to here. So essentially, it will take us from here and go all the way up to here. And it will also include up here as well. But you see, this area right here is only overlapped by two lines. This area is only overlapped by two lines. And these are only overlapped by one. The only area that is actually overlapped by all three lines is going to be from negative 30 degrees to 90 degrees. So that's how we know that anything that has a P wave that's upright in one and two and inverted in AVR, we can automatically throw out all the other rules. We don't have to do any other leads. We don't have to look at any of the other leads. All we have to do is look at these three leads. If this suffices, that means we know it's a normal axis. We don't have to do anything else. So you can forget about this entire table, all these different diagrams, all these different things that have haunted you for a while. Don't even look at those. All you need to know is, is the P wave upright in one and two and inverted in AVR. If it is, you have a normal axis. End of story. So let's take this for example. Okay. So we're, we're trying to figure out, first off, what is the rate? Okay, so the rate is this 60 beats per minute. And if we actually did it, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Remember 10 by 6, because this is a 10 second lead. This is going to be 60 beats per minute. This looks very regular. The, our intervals are going to be all the same. So this is also regular. And now we want to know, uh, what is the axis? Is it normal or is it abnormal? And so what did I say before? We take one, two, 
and AVR. So these should both be upright, and then this one should be down. So we see that it's upright in one and two, and it's inverted in AVR. So what do we say? We say this is a normal axis. So that's all we have to do. We didn't have to look at all the other leads. We don't have to calculate exactly what, because if you actually did all the leads, there would be only one place. It would be one degree. It will give you one exact point on that little pie chart that it is, and, if, and you can determine whether or not it's normal or abnormal. But we don't have to do that. We can throw all those other rules out the window and only look at these three leads. It will save you a lot of time, and you'll actually remember it. I can never remember any of that other stuff. This is the one thing that I can remember. So the next thing that I want to talk about is ischemia. And I'll talk about this very briefly just because I'll talk about it in other videos. But you're essentially going to have two things. You're going to have a STEMI or you're going to have an NSTEMI. STEMI, ST elevation, MI and semi non ST elevation MI. Um, it says you're going to have evidence of an MI through other things, specifically in lab values. And so a new STEMI is going to have ST elevation of greater than one box in two continuous leads. I'll leave it at that because there's a lot of other rules that you have to know, but essentially just know that you at least have to have one box elevation from the J point to the end of the P interval. Essentially, if you have evidence of ischemia, then that's something that you can comment on, that there is evidence, or at least there's evidence of ST changes. You don't even have to say if there's ST elevation or ST depression. If you don't know, if it just looks abnormal, just you can say that there's at least some sort of ST abnormalities that you see. The next thing is going to be the hypertrophy. Is there any evidence of hypertrophy? And after actually looking into this some more, there's a, a lot more detail that I think is much more than I ever thought about uh, hypertrophy before, I want to make it this as simple as possible. And so essentially, if you ha can either have left ventricular hypertrophy or right ventricular hypertrophy, and that's just, is the left side bigger or is the right side bigger? And so if the left side, if you're going to have left ventricular hypertrophy, that means all of the left-sided leads are going to show more elevation. And so that's essentially going to mean all of the R waves on the left-sided leads, which are going to be V4, V5, V6, 1, and AVL, are going to have very high amplitudes, which is going to be all these guys right here. They're very high and, and positive values. And in addition to that, all of the S waves, because they're in the opposite direction of the right-sided leads, are all going to be very negative, right? And these are going to be V1 to V3, as well as 3. And we see that evidence here. And so that's going to be evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy. And then in right ventricular hypertrophy, it's going to be the exact opposite. I think that the simplest way to break this down is really this. If you see big QRS complex, you can essentially be pretty safe to say that it's probably going to be left ventricular hypertrophy. Left ventricular hypertrophy is significantly more um, common than right ventricular hypertrophy because what is the common cause of LVH is going to be hypertension or anything that causes an increased afterload on the heart. And so in that scenario, if I ever see these things overlapping, I'm just going to say, okay, there's evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy. And, and nine times out of 10, I'm going to be right. And how much it, it is, there's different criteria that can actually break it down of how big you need to be. I typically say if it's, it's three or more boxes, um, you can pretty safely assume that there's going to be some evidence of hypertrophy. And typically when you're asked these type of questions, they're going to be pretty, pretty obvious. So that's kind of the simplest version of how do you determine whether or not there's hypertrophy hypertrophy or not. So the last thing I want to talk about is normal sinus rhythm. Okay, so normal sinus rhythm essentially means that everything is normal. It's going to have a normal rate. It's going to be regular. It's going to also be a normal axis and all of the different intervals are going to be within the reference range and there's going to be no evidence of ischemia or hypertrophy. Essentially, it just means everything's perfect. Everything's normal. Everything's normal and, and how it should be. And it's the default rhythm. So essentially, we'll, we'll take you through an example right here. So the first thing is going to be, uh, what is the rate? So let's look at this. This is a 12-lead EKG, so this is going to be 10 seconds. So automatically, we know this is going to be six times how many ever beats. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. All right, perfect. It's it's within a regular, it's within a normal rate, I should say. Next is going to be, is it regular? Are all the R waves regularly spaced? And and it looks like it. they are. Are there P waves in front of every QRS? So we see there's P waves in front of every QRS, okay? And we can just kind of map those out. And there's P waves in front of every QRS. Is it a normal axis? Well, what did I say before? One, two, and AVR, okay? So we see P waves are positive. 
in one and two. And we see that P waves, and it's hard to, uh, here it's probably easier to see, P waves are inverted in the AVR. So we know right there, it's normal. If we were actually to map out the intervals, just giving a very broad overview look at this, it looks to be normal, right? So we can kind of uh, say that all the, the PR intervals, the QRS, um, as well as the QT, they all look to be within normal range. And there's no evidence, at least that I can see, of any ST elevation as well as hypertrophy. So that's kind of how we walk through this particular example. Uh, so hopefully that helped you to kind of get a general overview of how you would approach an EKG. And this is kind of how, if, if anybody ever asks you, can you read this EKG? Well, that's kind of how you go through it. You do all those steps and you also will say if there's anything else that you notice that's different or all the things that you've noticed. If it's irregular, irregular, and there's this type of rate and there's this type of axis and things like that, then you can kind of come to some type of differential of what you may think this EKG is showing. But I just showed you a normal sinus rhythm. Be sure to check out medicalbasics.com for more educational resources like our HP notebook. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more tips and lessons.